Hi everybody, this is Katie Bailey and I'm back today to discuss head and neck anatomy via the important landmarks. Our goal is to review head and neck anatomy in as few landmarks as possible to make it easier for you to distinguish between the different cavities and pharyngeal components. To start, how to tell the nasal cavity from the nasopharynx. The nasal cavity extends from the nostrils to the posterior nasal aperture to the cribriform plate. So below the cribriform plate, from the nose back, basically consider it to the end of the hard palate. Everything anterior to this is cavity. Posterior to this, so from the edge of the hard palate to the clivus, is the nasopharynx. And here's the nasopharyngeal lymphoid tissue lining anterior to the clivus. And so here it is in landmarks, this area posterior to these lines is the nasopharynx. On the axial view, you see the classic components. Here's the torus tuberius, and here's the fossa of Rosenmuller, which is lined by squamous epithelium, which is why squamous cell carcinomas of the nasopharynx tend to originate off the midline, whereas nasopharyngeal lymphomas start in the midline as that is where the majority of the lymphoid tissue is. For oral cavity versus oropharynx, the oral cavity includes the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, so think of it as the edge of the hard palate anteriorly, so it involves the, the gingiva, portions of the soft palate, that oral tongue, Whereas the oropharynx is from that tip of the hard palate posteriorly to the spine, and it goes from that soft palate, including the uvula, to the top of the epiglottis. So this space is the oropharynx, and what you'd like to see on the axial view are these palatine tonsils, usually symmetric appearing, so above the level of the base of the tongue. The retromolar trigone is my favorite location in the head and neck. If you stick your tongue in the back of your mouth, that retromolar trigone is the space between the bony areas at the top and the bottom. On CT imaging with a puff cheek technique, this is the retromolar trigone. This is considered part of the oral cavity. It's lined by just mucosa and vessels, so it's a great place for secondary spread of neoplasm or infection. So this is the retromolar trigone, right and left. The floor of the mouth is made up of a bunch of muscles. The midline raffe is just a fatty line, but it tells you you're at the floor of mouth. Then just lateral to the midline raffe, you have the genioglossus muscle, paired muscles. Here's the sublingual space, which contains the neurovascular bundle. Here is the hyoglossus muscle which is lateral to the genioglossus muscle, and then the mylohyoid muscle is the outer aspect of the floor of mouth. So mylohyoid, hyoglossus, genioglossus. You need to notice the midline raffe because any cancers that cross the midline are a higher stage, and anything that invades into that neurovascular bundle in the sublingual space is also upgraded in terms of cancer staging. Here it is on the sagittal view, just think from bone to bone. So here's the anterior mandible, here's the hyoid bone, here's the floor of mouth. It has a mucosal surface underneath the tongue, and then it has the floor of mouth musculature as well. The tongue base, which is posterior to the hyoid here, is actually considered part of the oropharynx. The hypopharynx is a less specific area. It's this area epiglottic fold when it comes to the back. It forms this space that's called the piriform sinus. So this would be a hypopharyngeal mass if it originates here. So it consists of these piriform sinuses, the lateral and posterior pharyngeal walls, and then it extends posterior to the larynx until you get to the cervical esophagus. So all this space back here would, can be, would be considered the hypopharynx. The supraglottic larynx is from that tip of the epiglottis to the laryngeal ventricle, which is this space right here. I like the coronal because it looks like a goblet. So you have the false cords, you have the ventricle, you have the true cords. So everything from the false cords up to the epiglottis is considered the supraglottic larynx. You want to make sure that there's no infiltration of that preepiglottic fat, and where the epiglottis attaches here is called the petiole. And here's that false cord on axial view. You're looking for fat density. The false cords are fatty. 
So you get to the glottis, you have the true vocal cords, the anterior and posterior commissures, which makes sense. It's where they meet in the front and the back. So anterior commissure, posterior commissure, true vocal cord is made up of muscle, so it should have soft tissue density. I like to look for the arytenoid cartilage because that's where that vocalis muscle attaches. Here's the cricoid cartilage posteriorly. So posterior to that would be hypopharynx. All of this is larynx. On the sagittal view, look for those paired true vocal cords going to the midline. The subglottic region is from the inferior surface of the vocal cords to the inferior aspect of the cricoid cartilage. Below this is the trachea. Usually this is not where you look for a primary lesion. You're looking for spread of a glottic cancer or a glottic lesion into the subglottic space because that upstages it. So this area under the inferior aspect of the true vocal cords to the bottom of the cricoid cartilage is the subglottic region. And that's it. Thank you for listening and watching my brief review of how to distinguish the spaces of the head and neck.